Hi there folks, Obsessive Compulsive Audiophile here, and this is the long anticipated subwoofer alignment tutorial. Proper subwoofer integration is often the missing piece in a truly immersive audio experience, yet many people struggle with misinformation and confusion, leading to suboptimal performance. Subwoofer alignment is often believed to be a peculiar art, accessible only to a select few audio files. However, most of the principles are surprisingly simple, and if you're tired of muddy bass that drones out other details in the sound, or hate those booming explosions that rattle your windows, then do keep watching. In this hopefully short video, I will explore the techniques, the science, and the practical steps to bass perfection, providing a clear step-by-step -step approach to subwoofer alignment. Whether you have a single sub, dual subs, or a complex multi-sub setup, by the end, you will have the knowledge and confidence to achieve tight and impactful bass that complements your music and movies and transform your experience. So, let's dive in. Assuming you're using Roaming Q Wizard for your measurements, let's first talk about some subwoofer measurement tips. Take multiple measurements at the main listening position and average them after eliminating all and distorted ones out. In this sample in that file, I have seven measurements for my left speaker. This is just an example of multiple measurements. All measurements are taken at the same microphone position. That's why, as you can see, the frequency response is very similar, but there are slight differences. Now, when we copy selections to other overlay graphs, all these selected ones go to overlays. You will see that in the unnormalized, we tick normalized and zoom in. There are subtle differences between the measurements, like L1 here has a shorter first peak and the shorter second reverse peak, etc. And this first milliseconds is very important in a measurement. Similarly, in the step graph, you can see that not every one of them is exactly time zero before the measurement. There have been distortions, and the easiest way to see is the distortion graph. And here you can see that this L3 has distortion peaks much higher than the average measurement. So we eliminate L3. Another way to do is to come here and right click on the picture here and disable this measurement. Now it's like this measurement doesn't exist until you enable it back. Back to overlays. What else here? Let's fit the data. Again, here there is a weird peak that no other measurement has, which is L6. So we remove that as well. There is another odd peak here that no other measurement has. Again, these are measurements all taken at the same microphone position, one after the other at the same time. So these are the differences. L4, so I eliminate that as well. And L7 has these peaks that the others don't have, so that goes away. It's not vital to remove them because they are mostly below the noise limit as they are grayed out. But since I have seven measurements, I can waste as many as I want. And the ones I'm going to use at the end, I'm going to vector average. In this particular example, I will end up with just one measurement because L5 also has this distortion here, as you see. And these last two, L2 and L1 are fine. But L2 has this peak here that, well, they both have one peak each. So I think I'll keep L1 and L2 in this situation. Now copy selection to other overlay graphs and impulse and step and etc. Very similar. Let's check clarity if there is any difference. C80 for musical clarity. This is the peak energy time versus energy after 80 milliseconds and it's a good measure of musical clarity. As you can see, actually the colors are very similar to each other so I can't really distinguish. Let's change the colors didn't change so let's make this one red or less well even the clarity is exactly the same rt60 well now we see that l1 here has a weird jump this delay graph does look like smoother so i will even eliminate l1 and use only l2 or I could vector average these two. And from this point onwards, L2 is my only left speaker measurement that I'm going to use and I'm going to make my correction filters for. 
Okay, that's measuring at the same microphone position for you folks. There is also the possibility that you measure around the central position and average them. It's better to have a more uniform response in a larger area. However, you will always compromise from the accuracy in the main listening position. It's not a win-win game. You either have more uniform response or you have better response at the MLP. I mean, if you want uniform base in a larger area, as I said in my previous videos, just get more subwoofers. And if you calibrate perfectly for the MLP, it will also affect the area around the LP to an extent, although not as much as otherwise achievable. One thing about the multiple microphone position measurements, you have to cross-correlate align them before you take a vector average. You have to align them to the measurement at the main listening position. These are all at the same microphone positions. These else so let me remove them actions remove that will remove all the selected measurements there are six of them there should be seven but because we disabled l2 rev doesn't see it so enable that and remove that or i could remove it here okay now i will show you with three subwoofer measurements Three measurements of the same subwoofer at three different microphone locations. One first location I called X0, the second location Y0 for the same sub, and the third and last position was main listening position. I took it the last so that I could keep the microphone there and keep measuring after for checking my filters. To have an average response, you have to cross correlate. You will see that there. Let's copy that to overlays again. See, subwoofer responses are very much smaller peaks compared to speaker responses because they don't have high frequency. So we plot normalized. Zoom in a little bit. And you see that in between the peaks of the subwoofers, there are differences. So they are at different position. MLP was in the middle here. And XO was a little bit to its left. And YO was a little bit to its right. Or front or rear. It doesn't matter, but they are at different locations. They arrived at the LP at different times. So I have to cross correlate them first before vector averaging them to find my average response at the MLP. So everything should be aligned to this blue one here. Okay. And how do I do that? Once you select here in all SPL tab, when you click cross correlate, they will all be aligned to the one, not this selected one. Okay. For example, selecting MLP and clicking cross correlation align will not align everything to MLP. It will align everything to XO because whichever measurement is on top of the others that are selected here will be the one that REM will align the others for. So let me demonstrate that actually. When I align like this cross correlation, you will see that they will move towards XO, this one. See, so undo T equals zero will undo the operation. Now to align everything to MLP, I have to move MLP to the top of the other measurements I'm going to be aligning. Okay. And now if I click cross correlate, you will see that they will all be aligned at the MLP. Clicking again. Here you go. See, it takes a little bit of time by REW because they are subwoofer measurements. And once you have them aligned, okay, then you can take vector average. And this is your subwoofer response now that you will use for the rest of the calibration. And when you EQ for this response, your result will be uniform at a, a larger area, the area that you covered with these three measurements, basically. If I average them without doing that, that's again undo t equals zero changes. So they are all back in their places. Remove vector average. And if I vector average them as is, here is the response and look what mistake I would be doing. Instead of this correct response, I would be calibrating for this major difference. So timing is everything done with these two. So remove. When everything is removed, the video will be over. So 
stay with me. You will most probably use 48k Hz sampling rate as this is REW's native rate and at this sampling rate frequency range is expected to cover half the sampling rate from 0 Hz to 24k Hz. Although most subwoofers will not produce anything other than noise beyond 200-250 Hz, it's advisable to use this full range for measurements. As in, when you're measuring a subwoofer, a lot of people tend to measure from 20 to 200 or 250 let's say. This is totally doable and acceptable, but it causes some minor problems. It's important for the accuracy of the measurement because REW will decrease the sampling rate of the measurement when it detects a narrow frequency band. Also, it's important for the accuracy of trace arithmetic operations and validity of some others. For example, cross-correlation aligning. This is one measurement I did from, as you can see here, Let's make it clearer. From 0 to 250 hertz here, see, frequency range. And Rave automatically assigned a sample rate of 3000 hertz to it, because this is enough to measure 250 hertz. And then this one, the same subwoofer at the same location, I measured from 0 to 24000, which is the norm for 48k hertz sampling rate. And this one automatically has a sampling rate of 48000. Now let's see what the problems will be. For example, I'm trying to cross-correlation align SW long measurement to short measurement, cross-correlation align. And here you go, this measurement was skipped because of not having a matching sampling rate. This is one problem. Also, if you're doing trace arithmetic and especially doing like divisions, etc., there will be a lot of deviations from reality due to different frequency bands. So it's advisable to use 0 to 24,000. And also for checking subwoofer delay, if you want to use group delay, and it's a solution for times you're struggling where to move the impulse peak, you will not have a group delay graph for a subwoofer which ends at 250 hertz to compare it with the speakers. We will later cover that. And there is also a way to avoid this problem to, to automatically assign a lower sampling rate when you do a low range measurement, and that is preferences. If you untick decimate IR, because this is why Rho decreases the sampling rate to save you memory, in fact, if you untick that, then no matter which range you use, Rho will stick to 48,000 hertz sampling rate. But I would still suggest you to take full range measurements. While we are at this page, because this is about subwoofer time alignment, okay, it's very important that you use acoustic reference in your measurements, which are here, use either acoustic timing reference or loopback as timing reference if your setup is more suitable to this one. And acoustic reference output should be the same speaker for all your measurements, including your speakers, every single subwoofer and what have you. Okay, even with the speaker itself, you have to measure it with the same acoustic reference throughout all your measurements, otherwise your time alignments will have no meaning. And by the same token, in preferences, Make sure you take adjust clock with acoustic ref or adjust clock with loopback, either one of them. Because this, uh, especially for USB microphones which have deviations, this avoids the clock drift. Rev calculates the time between the first chirp and the last chirp. Actually, it knows the time very well between these two chirps and then measures the time in your measurement. So it can very accurately correct the clock deviation by that. So you have to take that as well. These are very important settings for time alignments. We are done with these two as well now. And once you have an aligned subwoofer response, this is before you align two subwoofers to each other, but just have one measurement for a subwoofer, whether multiple microphone position or a single microphone position, you will end up with one single measurement for each sub. And at this stage, you can go to Reface, export the sub's excess phase response to Reface and use this for box and port correction. But this is optional due to the demanding number of filters it requires because it's in the base region and it's not easily applicable to simple setups. For example, almost impossible to do something like that with mini DSP's 1024 FIR tabs, but it's useful nonetheless. You can check my phase alignment video if you want to know how this is done, which is linked at the top right corner of the screen right now. And if you're using a multi-channel amp, like the Odyssey gang out there, remember that the DOT1 LFE channel is boosted by 10 dB by Dolby spec, and when you're playing an LFE signal from REW, the amp will boost the signal by 10 dB. 
You can do three things to avoid that. Dim the LFE volume in the amp. That is a separate setting than the subwoofer volume, by the way. Or use REW's new LFE measurement, which is here. Okay, LFE minus 10 dB, as you see. And you can even determine the LFE and frequency here. Okay. Fill silence with ditter, play ditter before sleep. Before sleep, these are important sometimes for if your deck is not waking up on time during a measurement. So I keep them on. I believe they increase accuracy, but I'm not sure at all. On LFE minus 10, you can also select here. So rev means send the sweep, which is 10 dB lowered. And then the third and the last way is if you measure full range from 0 to 24,000, the receiver's Dolby decoder will think that this is not an LFE signal and it's not gonna boost it. So you can just use the normal volume if you make full range measurements. Now let's start by aligning subwoofers between each other. Volume match all subs at the MLP first. The simplest way to do that is to use Rev's check levels button. Okay. For each subwoofer, Rev will generate a ping noise between these frequencies you mentioned here, and you will read the SPL level. Do this equate. I mean, if you're gonna use your subwoofer, for example, if you're gonna cross it over at 80 hertz with your speakers, and if it goes down to let's say 25 hertz your subwoofer then 25 to 80 check levels will produce this pink noise and you will have the exact average SPL of your subwoofer between these frequencies if you equalize every subwoofer at your MLP for the same range then you can forget about gain matching from then on and if you by during using alignment tool changing volume of one sub is very often meaningless it's just about removing a sub or removing others from the equation. You might have reasons to do that sometimes, but multiple subwoofer alignment is not about their different volume levels. If you equalize them at the MLP once, that's it. You don't have to deal with it ever again. It's all about timing difference between them. Once that's out of the way, now let's go to alignment of subwoofers. Now subwoofer one and two, these are measurements from different channel subscribers, by the way, these are real measurements. As you can see, this guy didn't measure over 200 hertz, which is okay. Now, what you do is, before anything else, you select the subwoofers, the two subwoofers, one and two, and take a vector average. So this is the response, summation response, both subwoofers together, when you do nothing. This is their original combined response. Obviously, because two subwoofers are working at the same time, there will be a 6 dB volume boost. So you add 6 dB here at SPL offset. If you measure these two subs together, this would be your the resulting frequency response. You can check that. I have checked that many, many times and it is accurate to, to 0.1 dB in audible range. Once you have that, you can now open alignment tool, which is under actions here. And you select the subwoofers that you want to align to each other. They will not be the ones you select here by default. So SW1 and SW2. And you can now untick. You see here every ticked measurement on the screen, alignment screen. We don't need to see SW1 or SW2 anymore. We just need our vector average, which is our default response. And as you see the aligned copy right now, the black one, you can't see it, of course. Let me like put it like this. Let's, let's make the range 10 to 200, our base range. Move it down a little bit, maybe even open up a little bit. Well, okay. Now, as I said, playing with gain doesn't make a difference. You just remove one of the subs or reset again. Okay, a line copy already is the same as our vector average, but the reason I created vector average beforehand is because a line copy will move with everything. So we keep this vector average as a reference to where we were originally on the screen. So this is the reason for it. Or I mean, rather than uh, taking a vector average, you could just click align some here and it would create one copy for you. And if you take it here, it's the same thing. Anyways, now, you have to go for the lowest dips on this frequency graph and equalize their phase slopes or phase. I picked this one now and 
align phase slope set cursor didn't work then try align phase set cursor this didn't work well either but which one was better uh, let's say this one but that's definitely not this dip okay the dip moved a little bit more now let me try here again this one didn't work and this one didn't work so let's go to this dip now align phase set slope align phase set cursor okay now there is a big dip here so i go there i try this one this looks good and i try this one this is even a little bit better no this is better so this now compared to the original response a little bit better here at 45 hertz and also it closes almost every dip above 70 hertz as much as it can so this looks like a good candidate so i just click align some here and continue working like let's try this step now i'm trying to raise it higher and higher the response slopes this one didn't work this is not better how about this dip here it will always end up at the same shapes at one point and you will understand give or take what is the best ever response from these two subs let's try this one no and then this one look this is very similar but the dip here is a little less than our best one yet and also i think here a little bit better so i make another alliance on these two subwoofers are not very good examples you don't get large changes and you always want to get rid of the deepest dip try this now it gets worse this is the best and can we improve this one a little bit yes with this one i think so another align sum here you are not looking for the flattest response here you're looking for the highest spl you can achieve okay when the spl is higher after eq it will be also flatter than the flat one so always go for the highest spl not the flattest one the highest with the least dips is your friend so this uh, two subwoofers don't really combine in too many different ways let me do some weird checks around here maybe go after this one you don't have to be very accurate with this dips at my final trials actually yeah I, I don't know if you already did this but let's also add another copy you can have as many identical copies as you want doesn't really matter and now we are okay before i close reset all and also give it a try with one of them inverted okay two of them inverted is the same thing but one of them inverted doesn't matter which one okay this can sometimes give better results look automatically it's flatter than the other one but we don't want flat we want higher so there's a huge dip here let's try that this one on oh, this one look it's flatter but not as high there is a dip here now how about that no and how about that okay i'll make a comp copy from this just to show you that it's not the best response just because it's flatter and i don't think it gets any better than this yeah i keep copying the same thing so you press you click align some and that's it you don't need to know anything by the way um generally you want this as small as possible because the longer the distance the more the time delay the more the time delay the slower the base so now we are done with the alignment tool and we can close it and now it's time to compare the align sums with each other this was our original and this is one of them this is one of them They're almost the same this is probably the same this is the same these are inverted versions and they are not as good anyway but if you want to make sure copy selections to other overlay graphs again and antic normalized so you see the impulse heights the original look how short it is compared to this one and this one and this one and this one so i can automatically eliminate this one and this one and this one so the inverted ones the align in impulse peaks are not as high you could see this in the step graph even better unnormalized you want a high step response 
first uh, step response then then they should be as low as possible so automatically this one goes and this one goes and this one goes and here very little differences but still this one looks like it's selling among the others number 10 and also number 9 also number well number 11 is a little bit lower here then we go to RT60 which is quite an important measure with these eliminated already and look this one this one this one too much delay here okay you don't want that and also this one so 10 or 9 and it looks like more like 10 because it's a little better RT60 it goes lower than this but still not sure so let's copy selections to other overlay graphs and go to group play and with group play well, there's almost no difference between these two psychoacoustic smoothing to our escape but yeah because it's it's measured only onto 200 you can't see much in these graphs clarity is our last chance because these are really very similar you remember that was a very little similar distance around here and with this one i think we can see that this has higher clarity so number 10 is the one we have to pick what we do is remove 8 9 11 12 and 13. remove i haven't even looked yet what is number eight what how much delay was applied but it's in the notes of the aligned sum number eight a sw1 b subwoofer 2 b was delayed by 2.91 milliseconds which is 998 millimeters so that i already know how to align these two subs between each other again this was the first subwoofer this was the second this was their original vector average and this is after our alignment obviously you have to remove smoothing from all of them or in a better way look at psychoacoustic smoothing and this is what alignment gave us this bit here from an acoustic point of view but also here it has more spl after 70 hertz which is important for multi-channel definitely because we have satellite speakers which you have to cross over way over 100 hertz anyways these two subwoofers are not a good example but this is how you optimize and your align sum from this point onwards is your subwoofer you have a single subwoofer and this is your subwoofer response this is where you're going to calibrate and make the corrections and whatnot and if you have more than two subwoofers then you go to alignment tool again and this time your first subwoofer is the aligned sum which is the sum of first two and here you pick your third subwoofer and then if you have a fourth one then you go with the aligned sum of the first three and the fourth subwoofer and this will be a solution and you will optimize them somehow but obviously there will be some positions that you're going to be missing okay if you compare all four together so in that respect i think mso the multiple subwoofer optimizer free tool is your best friend because it really has a very good algorithm that iteratively checks every single distance until it optimizes with least squares method i believe and also you can add all pass filters there which you can export to mini dsp as b quads so i suggest if you have more than two subwoofers and if you want the very best optimal result use mso but this will also give very very satisfactory results you will just spend more time i think on this when you have four subwoofers with two subwoofers you don't really need anything this is more than enough now back to our aligned sum uh, as i said we can use this one now as our subwoofer response and you will align for example to the speakers this one okay but two subs will need to be aligned in between themselves according to this information here which is subwoofer 2 should be delayed by 2.91 milliseconds so let's do that manually you don't have to you can directly use this one but just to show you because you will have to apply these settings in some sort of speaker distance to align your subs manually so copy them to overlays and go to there is impulse response i can plot normalize now so these are their impulse peaks sub one and sub two now 
REW is telling us to delay sub 2 by 2.91 milliseconds. As you see, sub 2 orange one is arriving earlier than sub 1, which is here, which arrives later because time moves this way here. Zero was back there. As you can see, this is t equals zero. And this is happening about 35 milliseconds after zero. And first, SW2 impulse peak is hitting, and then later, about 2.82 milliseconds later, the first sub is arriving to the listening position. And for the best alignment between these two subs, we have to move. B was 2.91 milliseconds, but because it's a delay, it has to be minus 2.91 milliseconds. And when you click tab key at this point, before you click anything, it will show you the distance here in millimeters. And some DSP tools that you cannot enter milliseconds, that you have to enter a distance, REW automatically is giving you the distance here. And if you cannot apply negative distances to your DSP, then move the other one by 998 millimeters. I mean, add SW1 998 millimeters instead of subtracting from SW2 998 millimeters. It's the same thing. And when I click apply now, you will see this one moving this way by 2.91 milliseconds. Well, it's not happening because I'm moving a line some. <laughs> Sorry, you can always zero cumulative shift and undo it. So I had to be selecting SW2 and minus 2.9. Now apply and see. So basically what REW told us that they are the best when they are perfectly aligned. So these two subwoofers probably are equal distance from NLP. And in dual subwoofer settings where you just use stereo, this could be the right way to align them anyways. Okay. And very often time alignment ends up like this. It's not very surprising, but you can get very different results as well. And now after this alignment, if I actually maybe there, it's not the same. After this alignment, when I take the vector average of the same two subwoofers, this is where I ended up. Let's remove smoothing again. And you will see that it is the exact same shape as the aligned sum, which is sorry, still unsmoothed. What is the difference? It's that we didn't add 6 dB to the vector image. And now they are identical, as you can see. Aligned sum are our vector average. So what Align Sum does is giving us the delay required to apply to one of the subwoofers. You can see it is in milliseconds as in time or as in distance in millimeters. And you can apply it to your DSP. And now your subwoofers are aligned. What is left is to align now this one subwoofer to the rest of the speakers. And for that we have, let's also get rid of these now, vector average and Align Sum and another vector average. Remove them all. Now, there are two examples for speaker and subwoofer. Speaker A and subwoofer A. Copy to overlays. Let's see their impulse graphs. This is the speaker and this is the subwoofer. The subwoofer has a lot of impulse peaks. Okay, there is here, there is here, there is here. So how do we align them to each other? And it's very similar in concept to time alignment of speakers at the LP as in aligning impulse peaks to each other. But because of the very different impulse shape of the subwoofer responses with many peaks, cross correlation may sometimes get it wrong. There are certain rules you can follow to avoid mistakes. It's always an impulse peak of the sub response, which needs to be aligned to the acoustic reference speaker impulse peak, which should be around t equals zero, as you see in this one. However, the impulse peak of the speaker when you see it, the subwoofer peak is usually too far away. It's always around zero if it's the acoustic center. So now, which is the peak? Are we going to align it to this one or this one or this one? Okay. Cross correlation align will usually get it right, but it might get it wrong sometimes, especially if you have multiple subwoofers time aligned to each other. But let's give it a try. Speaker A on top of subwoofer A, both of them are ticked, so I can click cross-correlation align. And 
RDW decided the highest peak, which is actually the, at 100. This, these peaks are not at 100, which is one is 74, the other one is at 70. So this is very logical, but to double check, you go to group delay. And since these are 0 to 24,000 measurements, if you smooth them by one one octave and smoothing, okay, and fit the data and open up this group delay graph. You can see that the subwoofer and the speaker is identical in even high frequencies about 10,000 Hertz. So these are perfectly aligned. Okay. If for example, by mistake, I align this one or this one to the main speaker or REW cross correlated it falsely and move it like that. Let's move it there for you. I have to apply 7.822 milliseconds to subwoofer A. And because it's moving to the left, it's positive. So 7.822 apply and voila. So for example, imagine REW falsely moved it here or you thought it's here. I will also show you another example. And if you check group delay graph now, you will see that the response of the subwoofer moved here and is showing you compared to the speaker about 7.75 milliseconds of extra delay applied. From which you can understand you have to go 7.75 this way, which is around here. So you understand that it was this peak that you had to move it. So let's rewind our, I don't remember the exact number, but minus 7.75 was it? Yeah, something like that. Or cross correlation align that will always take it back to exactly where it was. Yes, a little bit different. Okay, and the last question now is whether you should invert the subwoofer response compared to the speakers. Well, the impulse peak of the sub points down while the speaker impulse peak points up. The 100 is the peak. This one is 100. When you plot normalize, one of the tips will always be at 100. But the better way is to look at phase response around 10 to 200 because this is subwoofer we're talking about. So this is the speaker response. And this is the subwoofer response. You go and SPL in phase, and here you can invert the polarity of subwoofer when it's selected. Invert polarity and check the phase response, which is more suitable to the speaker. This is now inverted. And this is the normal version. Inverted, normal. I mean, you can clearly see that in the audible frequency over about 20 hertz, when it's inverted, it's a much more better harmony with the speaker face. So this subwoofer group should be inverted. Okay, all of them. So if you inverted one compared to the other for best alignment, then you have to re-invert each one again to make them suitable for the speaker set. So this is also how you determine impulse and polarity. Now, another example, we are done with these two, speaker B and subwoofer B. And this is just one additional method for you to align subwoofer to speaker. Okay, here, this is a subwoofer and this is a speaker crossed over and what have you. And they are incorrectly aligned to this peak, okay? which is logical. Some people align them to impulse response starts. So this subwoofer moves all the way from here to here. So speaker and the subwoofer start at the same time. But this is a very wrong alignment. Actually, I can show it to you at the end of this. Now, how you understand this is wrong? You go to group delay. And because this guy is correctly measured his subwoofer all the way to 24 Hertz, you can go to group delay and apply one month smoothing. And in group play graph, in one month smoothed group play graph, you can see that 
this is the subwoofer here and this is the speaker and there is a 6.52 millisecond about 2.2 meters the subwoofer needs to be delayed so it should arrive earlier you have to apply a delay to it if you go and do that or go to impulse 6.52 you start measuring 6.52 from here 9876.52 okay around here so what is around here this one so it should be this peak that you would align so, so with group delay you can also see that and one other way is generate excess phase of the speaker and the subwoofer okay and then these are the excess phase grams of both and remove IR delays of excess phases this is very logical you measure the extra delay of each speaker and sub and then remove them and when REW removes them it makes a note here of how much it moved them for subwoofer REW decided it has to move 6.45 milliseconds 2.2 meters and the speaker should move by 1.8 millimeters so this is even more accurate time alignment of the sub and the speaker okay so you can also understand this way how much you have to delay the subwoofer you have to delay this subwoofer by 6.45 milliseconds while you also undelay the speaker by a very small amount about 1.8 millimeters this is the most accurate way but it doesn't work with every measurement but this is an option if you get confused about where to align the subwoofer to the speaker this could sometimes work and what is delay at the end of the day these are the excess phase responses but excess phase needs to be produced each time so let's go over the phase what you're doing in fact okay let's say you want to phase the line a subwoofer with the speaker at not really good matches here but okay let's say 30 hertz okay you want to equalize their phases and there is about 90.52 degrees of phase difference between them okay do i have a calculator no let's try google using this large mouse pointer for you guys and it really sucks in picking things up 90.52 degrees phase shift divided by 360 degrees okay and this divided by frequency 30 and this is in seconds so multiply by 1000 8.38 milliseconds of delay okay this is what phases it depends on the frequency as well so if i apply subwoofer b 8.38 milliseconds of delay oops sorry I take it back and it should be minus minus 8.33 milliseconds of delay look at this phase at 30 degrees here wow. now they are equal at 30 degrees so this is basically what you're doing with time aligning and with this calculation technique you can also do very delicate phase adjustments at crossover points and what have you depending on your need right folks i was planning to go in that on specific configurations for setting up multiple subwoofers with odyssey but we are nearing the 45 minute mark so that will have to wait for the next video before ending this one two important notes i don't post new videos on a set schedule but rather when there are significant new developments in dsp methods to share with over 35 million youtube channels now subscribing is the best way to stay updated on my latest content and secondly don't forget to read the comment section below my videos with over 5,000 questions answered there last year it has become a valuable source for audio and dsp know-how and troubleshooting since those answers don't show up in web searches browsing the comments is a great way to improve your room correction skills stay well goodbye